Just look at us. It seems like just yesterday, and we were all getting ready to go off to college. Everything seems frozen in time now. Just a few photographs to remind us of where we were, what we felt, and how we've changed. Bible college is like that, I guess. We look forward to it with great anticipation and look back on it with mixed emotions. Empty because it was such a great and blessed experience. And relieved because, well, it's all over and we'll never be the same. Well, our lives have surely changed since coming here and some of us more than others. Good. How was your trip? All right. Carry your bags and load them up. All right, let's get them. What made you transfer to Pillsbury? Oh, a lot of reasons. Like what? Did the Lord give you a new direction? Mm. Didn't realize the Lord cared that much about my transferring. Sandy's uh, really looking forward to seeing you. She wrote me in her letters about some kind of, well, I think she called it practical Christian work in churches. Yeah. I hear you play trombone. Why? You in this church work too? Well... Actually, I'm one of the extension group leaders. Roommate, group leader, and he knows Sandy. All sounds a little too convenient. We're just well prepared is all. That's yours there. Where should I put these? Oh, anywhere for now. Well, how do you like it? You lived in one dormitory room. You've lived in them all. It's home, you know. Yeah. Right. Right. Say, there's a friend of yours waiting over at the Dipper. That's our snack shop. Sandy? I haven't seen her in months. Right. She wanted me to share something with you. Oh? Like what? Let's talk about it on the way. Sandy's got any talking to do, she can do it to me. Yeah. Brian was different. You live in a dormitory with a guy for two years. You study with him, laugh with him, pray with him. Dormitory life, even at a Bible college, can bring out the best and the worst in a guy. Guys come to Bible college for all kinds of reasons. Some good, some questionable. But the real casualties are those who are sidetracked. They come with a clear-cut idea of what God expects of them and where he's leading. Then casually, almost accidentally, they lose their priorities. Others fall victim to popularity, poor grades, or social activities. Before long, they're gone. And there were guys like Brian. Guys who really didn't know why they were there. It was ironic, really. Because Sandy did. She was something very special. mature, loving and naive. Perhaps they knew each other better than I thought. But my first impression was that they were both headed for disappointment. Annoyed with something? Look, why would I be annoyed? Well, you weren't exactly polite at the dipper. I'm a little nervous is all. About what? Well, for one, my playing trombone for the team. If you're good at it. Well, perhaps. But does that give your friends the right to talk the matter to death? What a blessing your talent is. What fellowship we'll have. Why, you're just an answer to prayer. They sure had enough of the pious cliches. I didn't know whether I'd gag or bleh. Come on, Brian. Do your friends always talk like they're composing eulogies? The whole thing was stupid and embarrassing. Christians our age would give anything to serve God and well, some... I prefer Christians who aren't so heavy-handed with religion. Then why do 
did you come? Why? I thought that was rather obvious. Let's not... Let's. I'm not about to fall victim to your charm. I'm going to practice. What? You mean marriage has lost its appeal? You assured me that wasn't your motive. I've rethought my priorities. And so have I. Well, I'm tired of sainthood. You don't have to shout. And I didn't come here to learn how to be a fanatic. Let me assure you of one thing, Brian Kavanaugh. You didn't come here for me, either. Come on. I'll walk you to the music building. There's no need to. Sandy. I prefer you didn't. Time had separated them. The college would only intensify their differences. Take a hometown romance based on a rather shallow definition of love. The girl, a devout but naive Christian. The boy, coming from a Christian home, but, but giving every indication of the opposite. Show them both in a Christian college where outward displays of affection must be disciplined and tempered. And you'll have a situation worth plenty of Kleenex in the girl's dormitory. Sandy, what's wrong? It's Brian, isn't it? Oh, Jeannie. Poor Greg. I even asked him to get through to Brian. And that didn't work either. Come on. Let's go to dinner. He's not the same, Jeannie. You know what I think? I think you're the one who's changed. You'd think some of these guys would take the spiritual lead once in a while. Instead, they tag along, making all kinds of demands, without even considering the spiritual consequences. Some Christian guys are real jerks. They either twist scripture to fit their ego and use us like doormats, or... Or they're so ignorant to their spiritual role, they leave all the responsibility to us. And then love sours and turns to resentment. Greg's not like that, is he? No, he handles everything. Come to think about it, he handles so many problems, I feel a little left out. Has he decided about seminary yet? No. Sometimes I think all we can do is hang on to their shirt tails and pray. Well, Brian needs all the prayer he can get. That may have been true of Brian, but we all needed prayer. You don't decide to go into full-time Christian service lightly. Going to Bible college doesn't guarantee anything. You bring all your faults and failings, all your talents and abilities, and hopefully stay open enough to God's will. Slowly, almost reluctantly, Brian agreed to join the team. Thank you, gospel team, for a marvelous song that's touched our hearts. Now here's our brother, another member of this gospel team, Brother Greg Stevens. He's going to preach from his heart to you. You listen as he preaches. Thank you, Pastor. I think we would all admit that the term heredity has played a large part in our modern vocabulary. But there's one thing in this life which we can never inherit, and that's the gift of salvation. The Bible says in John 1, 11, 12, and 13, that he came into the Jews and they received him not. But to as many as received him, to them will he give authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And it goes on to say in verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of man, but of God. That verse speaks of a relationship which is not inherited through a blood relationship. In other words, as one man put it, you could stand in a garage for 20 years and you'll never become a car. And that's true about the spiritual realm. You can be in a Christian family. You can have godly parents. You can have parents who have been saved for years, but you'll never inherit salvation through them. You'll never have the gift of eternal life because of your parents' salvation. It also says, nor the will of the flesh. You can't work for your salvation. You can't save yourself. You can't pave your own way to heaven. You come to God through a personal relationship. 
Come to Jesus Christ, and he alone can meet your need. Brian seemed to enjoy performing with the group, but the preaching really turned him off. Oh, it wasn't anything you could pin him down to, but somewhere, under that smiling veneer, were some real doubts. Did I catch you listening this morning? You hear one salvation message. You've heard them all. Are your parents Christians? Pithy spiritual hyperbole and potlucks. That's mom and dad. Christianity is just passing on the latest dirt at Thursday night's ladies' fellowship or stuffing yourself with pancakes at prayer breakfast. Very relevant. You judge people long enough, and you'll never find any room to love them. Well, look, I don't like Christians who look like they were just wheeled off some geriatric wing in a hospital. Your gripes aren't exactly original either. Who cares about gossip and potlucks? The point is, are you a Christian? Well, I thought I'd become a hoodlum or a drug addict or maybe even a big-name country western star or a professional athlete before I got religion. That's not real Christianity. Oh, no? Big-name personalities are popping out of the pews like church mice, all making a fast buck in the name of the Lord. Well, who do you like? Too many double standards. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know what you mean. Too many big mouths who can't even answer a simple question. Hey! Look, I don't care what your beef is, but a Bible student who can't even give a testimony of his own salvation, there's got to be something wrong. I'm beginning to wonder what geriatric ward you were wheeled off of. Tactful, wasn't I? Well, sometimes you have to be blunt. Just lay it on the line. I figure honesty is the only way to approach someone you're concerned about, especially if he's your roommate and friend. The change that came over Brian was gradual. He joined in dormitory prayer, but he was unaware that each of us were praying for him. But the guys in the dormitory were praying for me, too. I still didn't know whether the Lord wanted me to go to seminary or work as a music director. For a lot of Bible students, the chapel holds some of the fondest memories. It's here that the entire student body met every day to sing, to pray, and to hear the faculty members the students and guest speakers alike preach the word or tell of their faith in Jesus Christ. Once a day, we'd lay aside our books and studies and suspend our position as teachers and students and examine our hearts before the Lord as a family. Yes, Pillsbury Baptist Bible College is more than grades of competition. It's more than even the opportunity to pursue practical full-time Christian service. What it really boils down to is learning. Learning the Word of God in a disciplined atmosphere and knowing how to apply that to everyday life. Yes, there was a unity of mind and strength of purpose that I sensed every time I attended chapel. And while the memories would fade with time and circumstance, the spiritual nourishment I gained from those all too brief moments at chapel would last through the years. There's a missionary from Scotland speaking in chapel today. Well, since when did you get interested in missions? Perhaps you're unaware that I'm actually considering the mission field. Well, you can't expect me to be aware of things when you ignore me. It's not intentional. Well, what about the offer you got from your church back home to be music director next year? I wrote them and told them I was undecided. Yes, but we're getting married. It's good, steady work. It's what you wanted. Look, we've got to get into chapel. Are you coming? No, I'm waiting for Sandy. Greg. It was a difficult time for Jeannie and me. But the missionary that day in chapel spoke of the many ways a Christian could be used of God on the mission field. On the mission field, the Lord has provided a variety of opportunities to reach out to the world with all the spiritual and technical know-how of our present generation. Opportunities such as aviation, linguistics, medicine, literature, films, and, and music. They can be used as a missionary outreach, but the primary 
And the most important method of winning the loss for Jesus Christ is the preaching of the Word of God. I had felt uneasy for months about my decision to go into music. A thought kept returning to my mind that perhaps music wasn't the most important. That I was planning on being a minister of music because it was convenient for Jeannie and me. But had God really called me to it? I'll see that you get the uh, application blank for us in the church and right after chapel tomorrow. Okay. All right, real good. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? Hi. I have a question I'd like to ask you. Yes. How can a person really tell when he's called to the mission field? A call can come as the Holy Spirit impresses upon us a real concern for the lost condition of mankind. Jesus Christ himself had that compassion, had that concern, a, a compassion which caused him to cry out in the book of Matthew that uh, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. But many Christians already do that. And what separates that kind of a concern from a concern which leads to a conviction to actually go to the mission field? You said it, conviction. You know, a person's concern becomes a conviction, a divine conviction to act. It's uh, like many people, they go through life knowing all about the Great Commission, uh, having read it many times, having heard it preached from pulpits, hearing the missionary challenge, but they fail to act upon that command which God has given to go into all the world yes. and, and preach the gospel. God's Great Commission was beginning to take on new meaning. What still was unclear to me was how music could play an important part. I wondered if indeed it played any part at all. school sure holds a lot of memories. Take this gym. A lot of victories and defeats have been scored here. Not to mention the personal problems that came up off the court. Why don't you just 
come out and say it. What? That you're going to seminary. Let's watch the game. I think this is where I can help. Jeannie? Good. There was a time when we both planned together. Now, we don't even pray together. Greg, I just don't want to feel like I'm being left out. It has to be my decision. But what about our plan? Jeannie, everything up until now has been... What's good for me is what's good for you. Well, what's wrong with that? Nothing. But we've got to find out what the Lord wants. I just don't want to hear any more about my talents, about what I have to offer God. Because when you get all right down to it, my decision to go into music was all based on our getting married. Well, aren't we? I don't know. I don't... All I want is a quiet place to get alone with God. Oh, I wish I didn't feel so helpless. Jeannie, we're not even engaged yet. And if I'm going to be a good husband and graduate with any satisfaction that I'm yielded to God and in the center of his will, that, that I'm going to have to make this decision myself. I only wanted... I, I know what you wanted, Jeannie. But, but is that what the Lord wants? We're under no obligation to each other. I know. None. I love you very much, Jeannie. But what you and I want is irrelevant when it comes to God's will. Our only obligation to one another right now is prayer. And when we find the answer to that, then we must live with it. I love you, Greg. Come on. Let's go back inside. both in and outside the classroom. He pursues us and uses even the most ordinary events to touch our conscience and admit our need. For some, it may be a chapel service or maybe a Bible class. But for Brian, it was a history class that opened his awareness. And so I think we can say that there were four phases of the Great Awakening. Now, what were the results of the revival? Many historians, for example, have noted that the Great Awakening helped prepare the American people for the Revolutionary War. Then secondly, there was a great impact on the various denominations and churches. Statistically, the number of Baptist churches increased from about 60 in 1740 to 470 in 1776. 
Then a third result was a heightened spiritual condition of the American population in general. Thousands of Americans were saved during the Great Awakening. They learned that being orthodox and a member of a church was not enough, but that a person had to repent and accept Christ for himself personally under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And these new Christians then began to make a great impact on the spiritual and moral tone of their communities. A fourth result of the Great Awakening came in the area of education. A great number of colleges and universities were formed as a result of the revival. Brian's decision to accept Christ as his savior didn't come about by arguing major theological points or by batting a Bible over his head. It came through prayer, his reading and listening to God's word and through the love and concern of Christians around him. Even his attitude towards Sandy had taken a positive turn for the best. We haven't spoken to each other in quite some time. What do you say we don't remind ourselves of the past? Nervous? A little. Sandy, I want to apologize. It's not necessary, Brian. Sandy, please. It's taken me a long time to get to this point. Brian, you don't care. I have to. I have to tell you, I'm sorry. Look, I've judged all Christians by the way my parents live. So what does that have to do with us? I rejected them. Just like I rejected your parents. All I wanted to do was escape. To run away from all that hometown narrowness and hypocrisy. And to, well, take you with me. Anywhere. Uh, the West Coast. Some place where things were happening. And then? Well, you came here. Decided to be a hometown hypocrite by hiding away in a Bible college. At least that's what my first impression was. First impressions aren't always right. I... I can't make any promises, but I'd like to see us start over again. I've, I've learned that the real meaning of love isn't a possessive, selfish emotion or feeling but it's a generous and patient concern for others. And the Lord? Well, I guess I can't really reconsider the meaning of love without considering Him. You have to do more than consider Him, Brian. You have to accept it. Yeah. I guess it all boils down to my relationship with God. Maybe I've dodged him too long. Too long, Brian. I'm not even sure if I know where to begin. I'm not even sure about all my reasons for being here and coming to you like this. Except that I'm a sinner. And from what I've read in your word, that's reason enough. I've been resentful of spiritual things. 
judging your goodness and mercy by the humanness of Christians in general. I ridiculed my parents and yet found my own life wanting of joy and peace that they had. I wanted the best of two worlds, really. I wanted the benefits of the Christian life by relying on my parents' salvation while rejecting the, its demands. By refusing to come to terms with you myself. I want to ask for your forgiveness, Lord. In the innermost part of my heart, I know that you died on the cross to take away the sins of Brian Kavanaugh. And from the inmost part of me, I want you to come into my heart and indwell every part of my being with your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Brian? Greg. I, I thought I left the room quietly. I'm sorry if I woke you. What? Do you want to keep your decision a secret? Greg, I was thinking. I should go forward in our church on Sunday. And I guess baptism would be the next step. Brian? Yeah? I, I've made a decision, too. About seminary? I finally figured God doesn't want me to give up music or seminary. You're going to do both? Why not? The mission field is sophisticated enough. Why not a missionary who can preach, play the trumpet, and direct the choir? Why, maybe I could even help the nationals develop a music program in their own local church. That EBM missionary, Mr. Carmichael, he said that was really needed. You know what? What? I feel like a new man. Say, you feel like singing? Yeah, why not? Yes, that was a night I'll never forget. The Lord had worked in Brian's heart and mine the wonders of his will. And just like Brian said, we were new men. New men indeed. We went forward the next Sunday in our local church. Brian, to publicly display his newfound faith in Christ. And me, to acknowledge my conviction to go on a seminary. And to continue my preparation for the mission field to preach the word in the pulpit and with music. It was a warm, sun-filled spring day when we went forward for our diplomas. The kind of day just right for new beginnings. The Bible had become our guidebook. Our professors had given to us not only academic knowledge, but a part of their own zeal for the gospel of Christ. Now it was time to carry forth the message we had been trained to give to others. Four years ago, the Lord led you here to Pillsbury College. As freshmen, you were apprehensive, unprepared, and sometimes unconcerned. There has been a change in these four years, a change brought about by Jesus Christ himself. You have learned to give Christ first place in your lives. By studying the word of God, you have acquired the know-how necessary for a life of service to him. As Pillsbury graduates, you will be soul winners, preachers, missionaries, evangelists, Sunday school workers, Christian day school teachers, Christian secretaries, Christian nurses, ministers of music, or solid Christian laymen in local churches. Regardless of the position to which God calls you, a medical doctor, an engineer, an astronaut, or a whatnot, all need to be grounded in the Word of God. Pillsbury graduates, the question is now yours to answer. Upon what foundation will you continue to build your life? Will it always be upon Christ? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 
For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Yes, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jeannie, Sandy, Brian and I will never forget it. God has become the most important part of our lives. All four of us. When will I see you when I get home? I'll be teaching vacation Bible school at Grace Baptist. Good. We have a lot of catching up to do, Brian. I got my letter from the principal of that Christian day school. Were you accepted? Yep. It's on my way to teaching Bible, science, and coaching a little basketball. Sounds like you've got your future all planned out. Well, the Lord planned it. But there's only one thing missing. Oh? You. Sandy! Sandy! I love you, Brian. Well, the day we've all been waiting for. <laughs> Look at him. Everybody promising to keep in touch. I guess we'll all go on to that never-never land of potluck dinners and... and... fond memories. Jeannie? Could I interest you in the mission field? I was interested the day you went forward in church. Come on, there's our folks. Just look at us. It seems like just yesterday, and we were all getting ready to go off to college. Everything seems frozen in time now. Just a few photographs to remind us of where we were, what we felt, and how we've changed. Going to Bible college is like that, I guess. We look forward to it with great anticipation. And look back on it with mixed emotions. Empty because it was such a great and blessed experience and relieved because, well, it's all over and we'll never be the same. Yes, that was two years ago. Brian went on to teach and coach. He and Sandy were married last spring. Jeannie and I were married last month, following my first two years at seminary. Oh, hi, hon. Hi. What you looking at? <laughs> yes, our lives have surely changed since coming here. I guess you could say we'll never be the same. Upon what foundation will you continue to build your life? Will it always be upon Christ? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ.